hello. If you're just jumping on, give me just a second. I'm going to share this video into a couple of my groups. I actually got on a little bit earlier tonight than I normally do. Ooh, let me see if I can figure this out really quick. Okay. I got it shared. If you are jumping on and um, you're making comments and I don't reply, it's because I don't see them. Sometimes Facebook is a little weird. And if you make comments from one of the groups, I don't always see them. Um, tonight I wanted to jump on and hopefully be a little bit shorter than I normally am. I tend to get winded sometimes. Um, but I have my notes, so I'm going to try to stick to them. We'll see. Um, I wanted to talk about the about authority. What is our authority? What weapons do we have against the enemy? You know, he can come in like a flood. <clears throat> and again, I apologize. I'm still dealing with some sinus stuff. Uh, but what can we do? What can we do when the war, spiritual, spiritual war, is raging around us and we feel like we're getting beat up from the left and right? Do we just have to lay down and take it? Do we crawl in our bed and pull up the covers and cry? Been there, done that. Both of those been there, done that for many, many, many years. Um, what can we do? So today I'm going to be talking about our authority. I also am going to do another live very soon talking about our weapons of warfare. And they kind of go hand in hand. But for today we're just going to stick with authority. So the definition of authority is the power or right to give orders, make decisions, or enforce obedience. Sounds pretty powerful. So what is our authority? What do we operate in? What authority... Do we have over the enemy to make the attack stop? Well, one, Jesus gave us authority. He gave us authority to bind and loose. In Matthew 16, 19, it says, I will give you the keys. That means us. He gave us the keys. He had them and he handed them off to us. Now, what are these keys? It's authority of the kingdom and he kingdom of heaven and whatever you bid bind sorry whatever you bind forbid declare to be improper and unlawful on earth will have already been bound in heaven and whatever you loose permit declare lawful on earth will have already been loosed in heaven so what does this mean so we have we have the authority to bind and loose um, that means there are things that are operating against us and we combine them. For one, I, an example in my life, fear tries to creep back in sometimes. And so I will verbally in my house out loud say, fear, I bind you. I lose peace in my house. I'm binding and I'm loosing. I'm binding fear. It may not operate in my house. This is my house. It is not welcome here. It may not step foot into my door. Anything that is ungodly is not welcome in my home. So when, when I sense anything, I start binding it. You have to go. You can't stay. I bind you in the name of Jesus. And then I start loosing. I start loosing the peace of God. I start loosing um, courage. Because what's the opposite of fear? Courage. So that's binding and loosing. We also have authority in the name of Jesus. This one is huge, and I think it is so undervalued. At least it was in my life. Like I knew coming up, I got saved when I was 18. So I knew like we prayed and we ended it in the name of Jesus. But I never understood what that really meant until I started learning about spiritual warfare and um, about the words that we speak and the power of our words. You know, I would pray, Lord, Please heal me in the name of Jesus or Lord, take this fear from me in the name of Jesus or Lord, drive this depression away in the name of Jesus. But I never understood what walking in the authority in the name of Jesus really meant. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 says, for this reason also, and I'm reading from the Amplified. That is like one of my favorite versions, Amplified Bible. And I also love the NASB. <clears throat> it gives a little bit more depth to the scriptures. 
So if it sounds a little different and you're not familiar with those versions, that's why. So Philippians 2, 9 through 11, for this reason also, because he obeyed and so completely humbled himself, talking about Jesus, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that the, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in submission of those who are, who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess and openly acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means that when we use the name of Jesus, every enemy must bow. And I've seen this in my life over and over and over for the past seven months that I have been helping people with spiritual warfare and deliverance. And I've been um, just going militant against the enemy. Uh, and again, not people, but the demonic forces, you know, fear, depression, anxiety, uh, lust. I mean, they're numerous, but I've seen it work. I've seen it work in the lives of people. And when you start using the name of Jesus, demons start, start getting nervous. They don't care if you know about praise and worship, which that is powerful, but it's not as powerful as the name of Jesus. There is no other name above his name. There is no other word, no other um, thing that we can do that will cause the enemy to bow like using the name of Jesus. And we don't use it flippantly. We are very reverent of using his name, but we also understand that he has given us authority to walk in his name and use his name. Mark 16, 17 through 18 says, These signs will accompany those who have believed. And this is Jesus speaking. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in new tongues. They will pick up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will get well. So again, in his name, that is what we operate in. As Christians, what is more powerful than to be able to operate in the name of Jesus, the name that is above all things, and we have access to that authority. We can tap into that authority anytime we need it. It already says he's given us the keys. It already says the signs that will accompany people who have believed in him. In his name, we will do these things. The authority is just laying there waiting for us to pick it up. In my life, it laid for years until I learned how to pick it up and walk in it. I walk in his authority daily, not by my might, nor by my power, but by the power of God, by the Spirit of God. We can access his authority 24-7. We never have to lay it down. He says he has given it to us. It is ours. That That, as a child of God... That is part of the package deal. You know, when we come to Jesus and we give our heart to him, he gives us authority, his authority that we can walk in. And so many times we don't realize it and we don't know the authority that we can walk in and we get so beat up. So I want to encourage you, pick up that authority, start operating in that authority. You may not even feel like it when you first start, you know, going against the enemy in your life. It may feel like, oh, this is scary or, or, you know, I don't know if this is going to work, but put a little bit of faith with it. Start speaking out his name against the things that is coming against your life. If you have financial issues, start speaking to those. The word of God says that we can speak to a mountain and tell it to move, and it will move. Any mountain in your life, I don't know what your mountain is, start speaking to it. Tell it it's going to move. It has had its last day in your way. If it's finances, you know, spiritual struggle, or sorry, financial struggle, I speak to you. The word of God says, I can speak to a mountain and tell it to move. So right now I speak to you and tell you, you have to move. You have to get out of my way. Whatever it is, if it's health issues, speak to it. Tell it in the name of Jesus, it must bow. It must move. It must get out. We've also been given authority over the enemy. Well, who is the enemy? Well, our enemy, we have one and only one enemy, and that's the devil and his demons. So when I talk about the enemy, that's who I'm talking about. Now, there are people that may feel like they're your enemy. There are people that may feel like um, that are out to get you. But the enemy is usually the root cause of that. Him operating in and through them to hurt you. So when I talk about enemy, it's always, always demonic. Luke 10, 19 to 20. And this is Jesus again. He says, listen carefully. I have given you authority that you now possess to tread on serpents and scorpions 
And he's, he's talking about the enemy. Serpents and scorpions in this scripture is um, d demons. And the ability to exercise authority over all the power of the enemy, which is Satan, and nothing in any way will harm you. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits are subject to you. Catch that part. The spirits are subject to you. That means you have dominion over them. They are under your feet. Now, when we don't exercise our authority, they're not under our feet yet. The way to get them under our feet is to exercise our authority in the name of Jesus and by binding and loosing, and that is how we get them under our feet. They cannot control our lives. You have, I have, dominion over them. Jesus says it right in his words. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that the spirits are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. All of these fights, all of these, um, all of this turmoil, it is under our feet. And I think that that is the enemy's worst fear, that we will realize what our true identity is in Jesus, and that we will realize what power we have over him, and that he, we will realize that we do have dominion over him. I think he fights tooth and nail in the church to keep this a secret, because as long as this remains a secret, he can run rampant all over us. He can cause discord. He can cause um, division. He can cause sickness. He can cause pre, like premature death. He can run rampant because we don't understand that we have authority to tread over him. If he were truly over our feet, under our feet, his attacks would not look like they look. You can look all around us and see we need to rise up in our authority. We need to take dominion. We need to take dominion of our family. We need to take dominion of our marriages. We need to take dominion of our lives. And we need to put him under our feet where he belongs. And this all kind of reminds me of, a, of, of, I was laying in bed the other night and I started thinking about it. And I'm like, Lord, you know, what does this really look like? And it, it made me think of a horse. If you think of a horse that's never been ridden before and it's wild, it's untamed. What's the first thing it does when the rider tries to get on its back? It goes nuts. It will not let that rider sit on it. It is throwing him off. It will not take the bit in its mouth. It won't have anything about it, uh, anything of it. But what happens a little bit at a time? The rider, the guy breaking the horse, he wears the horse out. He'll make it run in circles. So it runs and runs and runs. It's not going anywhere, but it doesn't even realize it's not going anywhere. It's going in circles. It's getting nowhere, but what is he doing? He's wearing it down. Does the enemy do that in your life? He did in mine. I ran circles for years, years, around and around and around. And what was happening? I was getting more and more tired. So what happens to that horse? Eventually it gets exhausted. And then the rider goes and gets back on its back. And this time, it only tries to knock him off a little bit because it's exhausted and it's tired. It accepts him to an extent. So about a few days after this rider working with the horse, what happens? It readily accepts the bit. It takes this bit right in its mouth. It lets the rider get on its back. It lets itself, here it is, this huge horse, but it lets a man get on its back and rule it. It lets the man guide it where he wants it to go. If the horse is hungry, it doesn't matter because whose needs come first? The rider. If the horse is thirsty, doesn't matter. Whose needs come first? The rider. Who dictates? The man on the back. It's just like that with us and the enemy. At first, we may fight him tooth and nail. No, you're not gonna get on my back. No, you're not gonna do this to me. But what happens? After we're going around and around in circles before long, it gets to the point where we don't even notice he's on our back anymore. He's got the bit in our mouth. He's leading us around and we don't even know it. I had a wake up call and God completely opened my eyes and it's like, oh my goodness, I had no idea how much the enemy was controlling me. If you would have asked me, I would have said, oh, there's no way that the enemy's controlling me. I, I, you know, I, I'm a Christian. I've been a Christian since I was 18 years old. And there's no way that the enemy uses me. There's no way that the enemy uses my mouth to speak hurtful words. No, no. Yeah, I have struggles, but no. When God showed me 
how much I was controlled by the enemy. It was shocking. But it was because I wasn't walking in the authority he gave me. I didn't even know and I didn't even understand the authority that I had. Had I known that, I would have stopped it a long time ago. That is why I'm so passionate about talking to people. That is why I say the same stories over and over. That's why I talk about the same things over and over. No, I'm not fixated on the demonic. When I do lives, you hear me talk about that a lot because it is so misunderstood. In my private life, I am praise and worshiping God. I am helping people get closer to God. I have several people who reach out to me and I'm helping them draw closer to God. I'm getting closer to God. My husband and I talk about God all the time. I do so many lives about the enemy because that is the part that's lacking. The part that people don't understand is they don't have to be tormented. That's why I talk about this so much. It's not that I'm fixated. It's not that I'm unbalanced with my theology or with my with what I study. It's none of those things. I'm so passionate to help people get free. I want freedom because I don't want anybody to continue going through torment. I know what it's like. And we have authority and we can make it stop. And if I have to talk about this for the next uh, how many years I'm alive, and if that's the, what God leads me to do, then I'll do it gladly because I want more and more people to get free. We do not have to fear the enemy. Uh, I went through a period where, and my husband did the same thing, where it was like, um, I'm just going to hide from the enemy. I'm not going to confront him. I'm going to put the cover over my head and I'm going to pretend he's not there. And if I pretend he's not there, then he's not going to bother me. That was towards the end, right before I got completely free because I was just so tired. But the thing that we don't realize we have it we, we are born into a war from the moment i believe at the moment of conception there are demonic entities assigned to our lives because why is there so much trauma why is life so stinking hard sometimes it's because we have an enemy there is an enemy that wants to kill still and destroy us he does not want us to get close to god he wants to steal us from god he does not want us to help others. So whether we realize it or not, there is a war going on all around us. The Bible talks about it. I mean, there is a spiritual realm that the eye can't see most of the time. Sometimes we have glimpses of it, but there's a war all the time. There is a war for your soul. There is a war for your mind. There's a war for um, your very life all the time. We can ignore it, but then what happens? We get more and more bound. We get more and more um, trampled on by the enemy. Ignoring it doesn't work. My husband, he used to joke. And I mean, looking back now, we say, okay, this wasn't funny. But um, he would say, I will pretend it's not there and it won't bother me. Because he used to be very afraid of the enemy. We had a lot going on in our house from time to time. Because when I say I was tormented, like people that don't know me, the torment was... Um, in my mind but then it was also in my home so for instance there was a time when my husband was in the bathroom and uh, he was in there and the the shower curtain opened all the way scared him to death and he's like I'm just gonna pretend I don't see it like he he handled it by I'm gonna pretend I don't see it now he has completely changed. He's going to give his testimony. He's actually started working on it. He is like done, completely changed now. In spiritual warfare, he's like, no, none of that's going on in my house. It's got to go. But what my, my what I'm saying is, is we can pretend like there's not an enemy. We can pretend like there's not spiritual warfare. And the only thing that comes from that is more and more bondage. There is nothing to fear. In the scriptures I've given you, it is clear Jesus gives us authority over the enemy. We have authority over him. Where is this at? I want to say this one more time because this is so powerful to me. Nevertheless, do not rejoice at this, that those spirits are subject to you. They are subject to us. I mean, really get that. Let that sink in. We have dominion over them. What harm can they do to us? We have dominion. They are subject to us. In the name of Jesus, 
we can speak to them and they have to obey. And I've seen that with my physical eyes. While I've been doing deliverance sessions, it's amazing to me. Um, and maybe I'll do, I'll do a video sometime and just talk more about that. But I've watched them obey in the name of Jesus. People will be feeling certain things in their body and I'll say, in the name of Jesus, stop. Immediately they stop. I've even said, set up and look straight. They set up and look straight. They are under our dominion. When I say that, I mean it. As soon as the fear starts to try to come in, I tell it, leave in the name of Jesus. It runs. Not even for a second does it stay because we have dominion. We do not always have to be reactionary. We do not always have to be on the defensive. In my life, I am no longer on the defensive. I am on the offense. I am taking back territory. I'm pushing my boundary. I'm the one who draws the line in the sand and says, you won't cross this enemy. He does not dictate to me anymore. What does that look like? That looks like me speaking directly to the enemy. No, he's not standing here face to face, but he can hear me. It is me saying, you will not have your hands on my family. You will not have your hands in my finances. I am a child of God. You will not touch me. I dictate to you. Jesus said right here in his scripture, I have dominion over you. So I'm telling you what you will and won't do. You will take your hands off and you will leave. That is being on the offensive. We don't have to wait for something to happen in our life and then be on the defensive. Now we can defend ourselves for sure, but we can push back more and more territory. If the enemy is has like crowded in on you, push back. Take your territory back. What is your territory? Your family, your home, do you have a business? Your church? The the enemy doesn't belong in your church. Take your church back. Speak directly to him. You will not enter my church. You will not have my church. You will not attack my people. Those are the things we have dominion over. We can speak and they have to go. What is the enemy stolen from you? What is he trying to take from you? Is it your joy? Your peace? Your health? Your family? Your marriage? Your children? What has he taken from you? Sit back and do an inventory and think about that. Really think about it. What has he taken from you? I got to the place where almost everything was gone except the next breath. Just because everything was broken in my life because I was so sick. Everything, I had nothing left. Like nothing. I had no career. I had an education that I could not use. I had no real relationships as far as friends because I was too sick. Um, I had family, but I didn't engage with them because I was so sick. I didn't have a marriage because... I was sick, I was critical, I was bound, I was depressed, I was lost, I was, I mean, I literally had the television. That I, I, My life was minimized to I had the television. The enemy will do that if we let him. Now, I say no way, no way, he has to go. What has he stolen from you? What is the thing that God has promised you that the enemy is still clutching in his hand? What is your promised land? In the Israelites, whenever, and I love this story. It, to me, this is the epitome of spiritual warfare. Like, I love this, and it just gives me hope, and it gives me, um, just gives me fire. Like, I think about this. The Israelites were set free from Pharaoh. God miraculously set them free. Like, he came in, and he literally parted the Red Sea. They didn't have to do anything but walk through it. God did miracle after miracle after miracle, and he set them free from a tyrant. That was their enemy. That was their jailer. That was their slave slave owner. He set the, the he set them free. He did all of that. Yes, Moses had to show up, but the people themselves they just had to walk to victory. They just had to walk out. Now, when they got to their promised land, I think in my mind they probably thought it would look the same. Like God is sending us to us this promised land. He's given us this promise. It goes way back. Started with Abraham. And we're going to have this land. It's going to be all, all of these great things. It's going to be flowing with milk and honey. It's going to be ours. We're no longer going to be slaves. It's going to be great. What happens? They look at the land and what's the first thing they see? They see the giants on the land. They're not looking at the milk and honey anymore. They're not looking at, oh, that's freedom. They say, oh my goodness, there's giants in the land. 
I almost think that they thought that God would just run the giants off, but he didn't. He said, there's your promise. I provided the promise. Now you go take it. They was like, oh my goodness, the giants, what do we do? We're scared. They're big. We're this. They're that. Again, he didn't step in. I believe in my mind, he was saying, I've given you the tools to take it. Now you go take it. We sometimes have to act in conjunction with God. He's given us these promises. And now we have to go take them. If there is a giant living in your promised land, drive it off your land. Drive it out. Get into spiritual warfare and refuse to let that giant live in your land. Now, what does that look like for me? I still have some lingering health issues. I'm probably 85% better than I was before I went through deliverance, but I still have some lingering stuff. I speak to the enemy all the time. Like my lungs start getting congested again, or um, I start getting fatigued, or just some lingering things that are still, and I start speaking to the enemy. You will not have my lungs. You will not have my body. I am not going back to that. This is my promised land. God has promised me this, and I'm fighting the giants. Sometimes our promise is right there, and we're holding it. Now, what did God do for me? Mentally, I am 100%. Like there is not even an inkling of any of the mental illness, residual brain fog. I don't even have brain fog anymore. None of that. Period. It's gone. He showed me how to go through deliverance and do that. What is left in my promised land? There's a giant still there. And it's some health issues. Am I afraid of it? Nope. Is it going? Yep. It's going. Little by little, it's going. And I'm going to run it off completely. There will be a day, not very long, I believe, that the giant will fall completely. What giants do you have? Are they stopping you from your promised land? Are they stopping you from holding that thing that God promised you? What has God promised you? He's given us all promises. Along the way, he's given us all promises. But if you see the giant, have you gotten discouraged? Have you been afraid? Has it looked too big? I just want to encourage you. You have dominion over every giant. Maybe you have 10 giants in your promised land. I don't know. But no matter how many you have, you have dominion over each and every one of them. You have the sword of truth in your hand, which is the word of God. That will defeat every giant. There is nothing that can stand against that. You have the name of Jesus that you can walk in the authority of, and there is nothing above his name. Every knee will bow. That means the giants in your life will bow at the name of Jesus. Got a little ahead of myself, but that's okay. God always does that. I start one way and he says, let's go this way. So we go that way. So what are some weapons of warfare that we can do to take our, our promised land back? And again, I'm going to do a whole video on weapons of warfare, but I do want to hit a few things because I don't want to take you this far, then leave you and say, well, get rid of your giants, but don't tell you how. I want to tell you how. One, verbally assault, verbally assault the enemy with the word of God. This is so powerful. I have seen this in my life. It is so powerful. And what do I mean by that? Get out your Bible. Start reading out loud to the enemy. Find scripture that pertain to your situation. One of the ones I love is Isaiah 54, 17. No weapon formed against me will prosper. None. No means no. We don't need a translation for that. So whenever the enemy tries to come in, I say, no. No weapon formed against me will prosper. Period. We don't even have to take it any further than that. So enemy, I'm speaking to you right now. The word of my God says, no weapon formed against me shall prosper. So no matter what you're doing, no matter what you're trying, no matter what you're trying to bring, it will not prosper, so go now. Another one that I like, when the, um, I just went blank. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will raise up a standard. I love that one. Enemy, you're trying to come in like a flood, but my God is raising up a standard. You cannot touch me. You cannot touch my family. God has a hedge of protection around me that you cannot enter. Another one, resist the devil and he will flee. Enemy, I'm resisting you right now. So that means I'm doing my part. Your part is now you have to flee. So go in Jesus' name. 
And there's just, just find ones that you really like. There are so many in the Bible that we can use. Put your name in them. Speak directly to the enemy. It's also a good, uh, when you pray, you can pray back to God his word. You know, Lord, you said, if I resist the enemy, then he would have to flee. So I pray that you would send your angels down to make him flee. You know, if you're feeling like you're just not getting breakthrough, there's nothing wrong with asking God to send help. I do that all the time. God, I pray that you would send your warring angels down to help and push back the enemy, push back. I mean, in the Bible, it talks about warring angels who go against the demonic. So I see no reason why we can't ask God to, to send them down and help um, and to do spiritual warfare. And I also pray a hedge of protection around my family and I speak to the enemy. My family has a hedge of protection around them. I plead the blood of Jesus over each member of my family. You may not touch that. I claim them for Jesus Christ, period. You have to flee. And I do this, uh, well, I'll give an example in a minute. Um, one, I do it every time I feel God prompted me to do it. If he says, um, pray for so-and-so, then I will pray for them and ask God to move in their life. And then I will also rebuke the enemy in their life. So I do both. I pray for, for God's assistance and then I rebuke the enemy in their life. And then I also do it just if I'm feeling any type of way. And then I do it just in general for him to keep his hands off my family. Praise and worship is another amazing weapon of warfare. The enemy does not like praise. The enemy does not like to hear you say how good God is. That could mean music or it could just be you standing in your house talking about how good God is. Verbalize it. The enemy can't hear your thoughts. So say it out loud. God, I'm so thankful for this. Start start listing the things that God has done for you, and two things happen. One, the presence of God falls because it says he inhib inhibits the praise of his people, and two, the enemy runs. He does not want to hear the goodness of God. Rebuke and bind the enemy in the name of Jesus. Let me think of an example for that. Um, anything that I feel coming into my house, I rebuke. Like if, if I feel fear trying to slip in, I will say, I rebuke you fear in the name of Jesus. I rebuke the words you're whispering to me. Um, I rebuke the thoughts you're trying to give me and immediately it lifts. If I know that someone um, in my family is being attacked in a certain way, whatever the attack is, I will rebuke it in the name of Jesus. Now, how do we walk in authority? I've talked about the authority Jesus has given us and that's for every believer. Everyone who walks with the Lord, it's for, every, it's for every believer. But how do we walk with the Lord? Well, right living. What does the Bible say? Are we living the way that the Word of God says we're living? Are we cultivating a personal relationship with Jesus Christ? Are we living to His will and not ours? Are we submitted to Jesus? Are we submitted and walking the walk that He wants us to walk? Because I find this, well, I'm getting ahead, hold on. So in Romans 12, I love Romans. Romans is a really good book about just how to live. And I'm going to kind of skip through this. This is Romans 12, 1 through 2. Present your bodies as a live, living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to God, which is your logical act of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed and progressively changed by the renewing of your mind, focusing on godly values and ethical attitudes, so that you may prove for yourself what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect in his plan for you. So I believe that in order to walk in his authority, we have to be walking with him. Not everyone who says that they're a Christian is going to be able to walk in his authority. Because it's one thing to say that we're a Christian, but what does your life look like? Does your life reflect his? Are you living in submission? It's not like just a math equation that where two plus two equals four using his name. It is you have to walk in authority under his authority to be able to walk in his authority. And that's a really important key. I can show you a scripture in the Bible where what can happen if you are trying to use his authority, but you're not walking with him. It's in Acts 19, 11 through 20. This is a really long one, so I'll try to, well, it's good. I'll read it. I'll go quick. God was doing extraordinary and unusual miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or face towels or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and their diseases left them. 
and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the traveling Jewish exorcists also attempted to call the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I implore you and solemnly command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of one named Sceva, a Jewish chief priest, was doing this. But the evil spirit said, I know and recognize and acknowledge Jesus, and I know Paul, but as for you, who are you? Then the men in whom the evil spirit was in leapt on them and subdued all of them and overpowered them so that they ran out of the house in terror, stripped naked and wounded. Okay, so in this story we hear they were trying to use the authority given by Jesus, but they weren't living for Jesus. They were just trying to borrow his name and use it in the same way Paul used it, and it didn't work for them. They got whooped by the demons. And so the first key to walking in authority is making sure you you have right living with Jesus. Do you have a real relationship with Jesus Christ? Does your heart belong to him? Are you living in submission to him? Is he your Lord? If he's not, then everything that I've just talked about tonight is not, not, not for you yet. First, you have to make him your Lord and master. Once he's your Lord and master, he's in your heart, you're submitted to him, then we can walk in the authority that he gave us. Here's another scripture in 1 John 3, 8. The one who practices sin, separating himself from God and offending him by acts of disobedience, indifference, or rebellion is of the devil and takes his inner character and moral values from him, not God. For the devil has sinned and violated God's law from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So we just have to make sure that we are walking with Jesus. And the first step of that is making sure you have a real relationship with him. Don't try to use his authority as a weapon against the enemy if you're not living submitted to him. Just like the seven sons of Sceva did, it won't work for you. Authority... Or submission is the biggest thing. I, sorry, I just got a text. Um, took my train of thought. Um, I do deliverance ministry all the time with people. And so I see how the name of Jesus works. But I also know that if I'm ever in a place in my life where I'm in rebellion to God or I'm not submitted to him or I'm not where I need to be, that is not something that I can operate in because the authority comes from Jesus through living close to him. Now, am I saying I don't sin? Absolutely not. What I'm saying is, is when I mess up, I go straight to God and I, and I tell him I'm sorry. I try to live a, as close to him as humanly possible. I fail, I fall, but I get back up. That's how I walk in authority. That's how we all walk in authority. That is the key to real relationship. When you're in a real relationship with somebody, you don't want to hurt them. You don't want to have distance between the two of you. And that's what it all, all amounts to, real relationship with Jesus Christ. Are you walking in real relationship with him? If you are, then that authority that he gave us is, is for you. We can exercise this authority over any demon, any situation, and it has to go in Jesus' name. So I want to give you a story kind of what this looks like practically. Um, I always like to leave like a practical application so that you see what it is I'm talking about because I give a lot of scripture, but how do I use this in my life? The other night, Ronnie and I were sleeping and the Lord had woke me up and I felt some, I just, I felt, um, I can't really even name exactly what I felt, but I knew I needed to pray. And so I was laying in bed and I was praying. And sometimes I don't know exactly what I'm supposed to start praying for. So I will pray for different things. And then I can feel when I hit on what it is I'm supposed to be praying for because then I feel release. So I was praying, but then the Lord was telling me, you know, rebuke the enemy. Make sure that the enemy is not coming into your home. So I started doing that. And I had just barely drifted off back to sleep. And I was awakened by Ronnie because I heard him in the living room praying. And this was in the middle of the night. He had gotten up and he came in the living room. So I yelled in the living room. I said, what are you praying for? He said, I don't know. He said, God woke me up and we're just really, you know, I'm just really praying against things in our home. So I got up 
and I anointed the doorpost and I anointed underneath or he anointed it and I was speaking and we anointed under the um, the threshold and what I was saying was no enemy can walk across this threshold I rebuke and I bind every demonic attack in the name of Jesus nothing for with ill intent may cross this threshold nobody with ill intent may cross this threshold and I was just speaking it. And I mean, the spirit of God just landed on me. And I was just um, like very authoritative. Like you could feel it when it's flowing through you and you could feel it when it's God and when you're really working and manifesting his authority. And it was like, I was just very authoritative. And we, I stood at the front door and I did that probably for like 20 minutes. And then Ronnie was going around the house. I have no idea what that was about. I don't know what was trying to come in. I don't know if somebody was trying to, I don't know. I don't know. We don't know. But we know it, it released and we know we have per perfect peace. So that is how spiritual warfare can work. Be very sensitive to what God is telling you. He has given me words before to specifically pray. Um, there have been a couple different incidences with someone very close to me. And I know the enemy has tried to attack them. And he has given me specific words to speak out against the enemy. And then specific prayers to pray over that person. And I know this person's life has been tried to have been um, taken or at least harmed three different times. And God has given me the specific things to say and do. And each time they, came, they amounted to nothing. So be very sensitive to what God says. Especially as you start moving into spiritual warfare, you will, you will become um, very sensitive to it. And you will walk in greater and greater authority and the enemy just doesn't scare you anymore because yes he's tried to attack big deal my god's bigger what can he do god is greater we serve a merciful and loving and kind god the creator of all things there is nothing bigger than that do not let the enemy take an inch in your life because if you give him an inch he'll take a mile he will always take more than you think you will. We may think we're just cracking a small little door or we're just doing a little bit or it's not that bad or it's this or it's that or, you know, I'm tired. I don't feel like praying against this. You know, I'll pray about it tomorrow. But where you let him come in, he'll take a mile. Just like I was talking earlier about the horse getting wore out because it runs around and around and around. We can do the same thing. And I promise you when you are, are at your most tired, if you're sick, that is when he will come in like a flood. Why? Because he knows. He knows you're tired. He knows you don't feel like praying. He knows you don't feel like turning on praise and worship music. He knows you don't feel like binding and rebuking him. Of course, that's when he's going to attack. This is a war. We are in a literal war. We have to understand our enemy. The Bible says, know the schemes of our enemy so that we're not caught off guard. Another verse said he's like a lion or he's like a, I can't remember the word it uses, but he's standing at the, he's crouching at the door waiting to attack. So he is always watching. He's not going to give you a break. He's not going to say, oh, they've got so much piled on them. Let me back off. Doesn't happen like that. He says, oh, let me pile more on. So the more tired you feel, don't, don't neglect it if you feel like God is leading you. Or even if you don't even feel like God's leading you. Because just like with the giants in, in the promised land, God said, go take it. So even if you're tired, don't let the enemy run over you. Stand up to him. Because here's what happens. The more you stand up to him, the less he fights. Yes, he still fights, but the less, because he knows that every time he comes in, you're going to fight and send him running. So stand up to him. Don't let him bully you. He's a bully. That's it. And once you fight back to a bully, what happens? They give up and run away because they're actually weak. And he knows. He knows we have authority over him. He just doesn't want us to know that. Like, he knows the word of God. He understands authority. He knows it because he does submit. But he doesn't want us to know that. And I encourage you to put on the full armor of God every single day. We can pray that. Like we don't, um, you know, we can say, Lord, I put on your helmet of salvation. And that is my hope in you. I put on the belt of truth because I walk in your truth. I put on the shoes that lead me in peace. I pull up the shield of faith that is going to protect me from every fiery dart of the enemy. Lord, I wear your breastplate of blood getting tongue tied. Lord, I wear your breastplate of righteousness that covers my heart, that keeps me safe, that keeps me sanctified and serving you. 
every day put on your full armor. And why are we wearing armor? Because we're in a war. You don't put on armor to go sit on the front pew. Church isn't bad, and I'm not saying that at all. All I'm saying is, is that armor isn't worn to just go sit on the pew. Armor isn't worn to just sit and read your Bible. Armor is worn when you're in a war, for warfare, and that's what we're in. Now, those other things are amazing and great. I'm not, I'm not talking against anything like that, but what I'm saying is, is when the Bible says put on the armor of God, he doesn't say to put on the armor of God to go out back and do gardening. I mean, that's why, do, why else would he say armor? Armor is for war. We are in war. And we have to take that mentality against the enemy. We have to get angry at the enemy. You know, when I'm working with people, I'm like, you get angry at the enemy. The enemy has tried to kill you, has tried to take your very life. Look what he has done to your children. Look at what he's done to your relationships. That is the enemy. Get angry. Fight back. When I'm in warfare, I stomp my feet. I clap my hands. I'm yelling. I don't care what I look like. The enemy's running. That's all I care about. My life is different. That's all I care about. I, I just don't care. I don't care about what people think. I don't care about what it looks like. Um, the people who want freedom find me. And not just me. I don't mean that. What I mean is, is I have naysayers who say, we don't have to do this. You're taking things a little bit too far. It don't have to look this way. That's what I mean by that. But the people who really want to learn about warfare, they find me or they find a book or they find somebody else or God tells them specifically. I'm looking for people who want to rise up and learn how to fight the enemy and go and teach somebody else. I want people to get free and then go set other people free. My dream is that every person that I help get free, they go help other people get free, then they go help people get free, and then they help people get free. And that we have this huge army against the enemy and we push back the darkness. That's my dream. That's my hope. Thank you for hanging out with me tonight. I did go a little longer than I thought. I always do. So it doesn't surprise me. I literally start with three pages of notes. Like, like I, I, I back it off and I'm like, okay, three pages of notes. But then I get winded. I hope that this is ministered to you. Um, I am planning on, we are in the middle of trying to sell our house and looking for a house, but I am going to try to start getting much more um, uh, devoted to coming live uh, more often. I have like six messages, I think, setting that I've already typed up now that I just need to, to do. Excuse me. So I do plan on doing that a lot sooner. I get sidetracked sometimes because I get a lot of... Um, what some of you may not know is I'm doing a ton of deliverance sessions like all throughout the week last week I think I did three and they can last anywhere from three six seven hours so they go really long so when I have a deliverance session in a day that's usually pretty much all I do that day so I'm not just sitting here doing nothing I'm actually um, doing my best to help people get free and get closer to Jesus I would love 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 to start helping people learn how to do deliverance for other people. I think that would be amazing. And I think God is leading me in that direction because I've actually started putting together a manual for exactly how I do things. And I'm going to do videos along with that. So I would, I, I'm actually going to work on that this evening. As soon as I have that ready, I will put that out there so that people can use it. I would love to see churches start jumping on board and offering that through church. I mean, that would be amazing. My, my thing is, if we could get churches on board, understanding spiritual warfare, teaching spiritual warfare, and offering deliverance, we could be setting the masses free. <laughs> it, it would just be, it, it would be astronomical, the people that could start getting free. So my, my vision, God's vision, I'm saying my vision, God's vision, he's been revealing a little bit more and more to me is I'm going, I am putting together training material and I'm not the only one. There are people that are doing this all over the place and they're having the same type of burden on their heart. So I know it's God moving and they're doing some of the same type of things. My whole vision is, is to, to train people to do spiritual warfare, train people to do deliverance. And then it just break out all over the place. Like that, that is, is my goal, my goal. For sure. I continue, of course, doing one-on-one -on -one deliverance sessions. I love doing that. Love seeing people get free. 
it just um, melts my heart every time I see Jesus break the bonds off of people. You know, I have people come in that have suffered like I've su I had suffered for years with stuff. And when it goes, I mean, God just shows up so big. And it's just amazing the things that he does in each and every session. Always shows up. So that's my heart. That's where I'm at. That's what I'm working on. If you have any questions at any time, you can contact me. You can message me on Instant Messenger. You can find all of my videos on YouTube if, if this was interesting for you. And I think that's all I got for tonight. So I'll talk to everybody later. Thanks for tuning in. Bye-bye.